A land of extremes and infinite variety, from lofty, wind-blasted mountains to rolling, mist-clad hills, from rugged Atlantic coasts to serene, sandy bays, West Cork, that southwest corner of Ireland defined by its amazing diversity, its wildlife, its scenery, its people and their activities. To many, West Cork is less a location, more a state of mind. We cover a number of subjects, from the great whales that feed off our coast to the endurance swimmers of Loch Eyne. We also look at the fabulously beautiful and tranquil locations that form the stage of this amazing theatre. Of all the cetacean species we see in the coastal waters off the southwest of Ireland, the minke whale is one of the most widely distributed. One of the smallest of the baleen whales, only the pygmy right whale is smaller, this pretty little whale is seen from tropical to polar regions. Although small in comparison to most other baleen whales, when fully grown they can exceed 30 feet in length and weigh in excess of 8 tons. The diminutive minke has one of the most complex and little understood population structures of any baleen whale. There is now evidence of considerable segregation by sex, age and reproductive status. In West Cork, the vast majority of sightings made within 5 to 8 miles of the coastline during May and June are now considered to be females with young, with males spending more time offshore. The females bring their young in from the deeper water to avoid the predation that they'd experience further offshore from sharks and orca. As the young feed on a rich diet of sprats and sand eels throughout the summer months, they will get larger and as they grow, they tend to feed further offshore. By driving shoals of fish to the surface and creating sometimes very large bait balls, they quickly attract the attention of gannets that fall out of the sky like confetti. It is never long before short-beaked common dolphins hear the commotion and appear to share in the bounty of these clear, unpolluted waters. Alongside minke whales and gannets, the dolphins create a feeding frenzy that is one of the amazing natural wonders of wild West Cork, a wildlife spectacle to rival any on the planet. So what of the future of this spectacular little baleen whale, the minke whale? Over the last few years, we have been seeing an increase in sightings. This may, of course, only be the result of food availability and distribution. However, during the last five years we've been studying these animals, we've been seeing an increase in the number of young animals much earlier in the season. This would suggest the breeding population in the northeast Atlantic is quite healthy. Overfishing, oil exploration, excessive coastal development, pollution, climate change and oceanic acidification may all ultimately adversely impact Ireland's smallest baleen whale. Although numbers are considered to be locally abundant, the lack of any firm or accurate data on population size and structure raises concerns about their over-exploitation through commercial whaling. In spite of the challenges faced by this spectacular little baleen whale, from climate change and other aspects of human behaviour, they continue to thrive in West Cork. As the young animals come in shore during the spring, 
locals and whale enthusiasts from around the world will gather on headlands with their binoculars and cameras and telescopes in the hope of getting a glimpse of the humble minke whale. As the winter storms regress and the sea calms away, the more intrepid amongst us will head out in boats in search of this true harbinger of spring. Cape Clear Island is Ireland's most southerly community. You can't live any further south in Ireland than on Cape Clear. Three miles long by one mile wide, this haven of tranquility lies just a few miles off the coast of southwest Cork. 45 minutes by ferry from Baltimore, the very remoteness of this island gem develops a characteristic self-sufficiency in its inhabitants. A 5,000 year old passage tomb a 12th century church, a 14th century castle, and megalithic standing stones are all testament to human habitation for many hundreds of years, even thousands of years. Part of the Gaeltacht, this island has its own primary school, where lessons are taught in the Irish language. Dry stone walls form a patchwork across the island's landscape with secluded harbours dramatic Atlantic cliffs, bogs, wildflower meadows, and a lake forming the backdrop for the 120 hardy souls that make this southerly bastion of the Irish language home. Fishing, farming, and tourism are mainstays of the island's economy. But making a living is not as easy as it looks. You can't eat the scenery. Neil O'Regan has been running the shop and Sean Ruhr's restaurant for the last few years. I drove the minibus on the island for a couple of days a week and doing tours for tourists you know, off the ferries and helping Mary and Jim O'Neill who was the coordinator at the time. And um, I got an opportunity to buy the shop and restaurant on the island. Um, and I did so, and uh, I bought that in 2004 and started in the shop and restaurant in November 2004. Running a small business on Cape Clear as opposed to the mainland um, offers logistically um, getting getting goods onto the island, getting fresh produce daily, several times daily. Um, initially when I moved here in 2004, I, I didn't realise that I had to be so organised in getting something simple like maybe a loaf of bread or a case of milk into the shop. Um, but after about a very fast learning curve, which took me 12 months, um, I got there. It took a while to get there, but, but they were, that was one of the biggest challenges. Then, of course, you have in the event of a winter storm where you might have a ferry travelling for a day or two days, and then all of a sudden you find you have no milk. Um, so we do quite a brisk trade, maybe one or two days a year in powdered milk. The ferry from Baltimore serves as a link to the mainland for the islanders and brings visitors. Conditions. 
Cape Clear's position surrounded by productive Atlantic waters has established the island as a key bird watching and marine wildlife destination. Petrels, skewers, minke whales, common dolphins and basking sharks are just some of the species that may be seen both on the land and on boat tours around the island from nearby Baltimore. Irish speaker Seamus O'Driscoll has been living on the island for 30 years, where the community spirit remains strong. Uh, we still have the concept of the metal, which is people coming together uh, to do things. And of course, the most recent example of that, one of the best examples, is that a group of people on the island have come together to purchase about 45 acres of land in South Harbour, which is uh, overlooking, uh, overlooking South Harbour, but it's also this is the most, one of the most southwesterly points in all of Europe, in all of Ireland, in all of Europe, where people can go whale and dolphin watching. And it was very important to us in this community to keep these lands open uh, for public access so that both ourselves and visitors to the island will be able to access, I would think, one of the most beautiful and unspoiled maritime landscapes in Europe. Mary McO'Donoghue is one of the oldest inhabitants on Cape Clear. Born on the Calf Islands and after some years of working on the mainland and in the UK, moved back to Cape Clear with her late husband to raise her family. Well, that time, you know, there were uh, all the people in Cape. We were, we had no one other. We were all the same people. We used to have cards playing, we used to have dances and sing songs and scurries and everything. You know, and there were happy days. That's all done away with, you know. And that's what you remember about That's what Cape. I remember about Cape. But it's the same today, isn't it? Not at all, the not, cape not, as not at all, the cape have changed completely. Really? Completely. It is good really in one way, but it has changed compared to what I Well, what do you think cape has changed mainly? How, how do you think it's changed mainly? Well, I think really there should be something done for the, the younger generation, because they leave cape, they're highly educated, and there's nothing for them to come back to. And they have to, go, to immigrate, there's nothing for them, which is really tragic, really. Many mother and father says goodbye to their sons and daughters and they never see them for a long, long time again. Cape Clear is a magical destination for a day trip or for extended visits and you'll want to come back. What will draw you back are the people, their warmth and generosity towards visitors, their fortitude and forbearance against the many challenges of island life. But I will leave the last word to the people of Cape Clear as to what makes their island so special for them. For me, I suppose, the thing that makes the, the difference, you can find landscape and history in lots of places, but what you may not find in other places is the sense of community. Tranquility. Um, summertime can be chaotic, but I can leave chaos in the shop and restaurant and walk for three minutes and I have complete and utter peace and quiet and solitude. The short beak common dolphin can be seen around the islands of West Cork in every month of the year. Numbers tend to peak as the summer progresses. Between the months of December and April, numbers decline as animals move further offshore, probably in response to food availability. But other factors such as water temperature and shortening day length may play a role. Considered resident in Irish coastal and offshore waters, this sleek, energetic, acrobatic species is a handsomely marked dolphin with a long, slender beak and characteristic, tall, scimitar-shaped dorsal fin. This beautiful little dolphin is widespread throughout tropical, subtropical and temperate regions of both the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. With its characteristic hourglass colour pattern of cream and yellow flank markings, this dolphin is seen off West Cork in social groups numbering anything from five to five hundred. I wanted to know why the short-beaked common dolphin was often found off West Cork 
in such huge numbers. So I met up with Brendan Collins, a local dolphin expert, to ask him just why this part of Ireland was such a magnet for the short-beaked common dolphin. Brendan has been observing the common dolphins off West Cork since he was a young boy heading out in small boats with his father. So, Brendan, what is it about West Cork that makes it so attractive to the short-beaked common dolphin? Well, these dolphins are attracted into the waters around West Cork and especially around the islands for the protection of it and the feed availability within the area. They feed on little sprats and shoaling fish like the sorry bill, locally known as the skipper. Tell me, is it only the opportunity to feed that brings these little animals into the waters around the islands of West Cork? Well, coming in to feed is probably one of the main driving forces that brings them in here. So, uh, we also believe that predation um, further offshore brings them in here. The uh, little common dolphin becomes a very tasty snack for a blue shark further offshore. When you encounter these beautiful little dolphins at sea, they will often change direction and deliberately engage the boat and bow ride, sometimes for long periods very close to the boat. I wondered if Brendan knew why they did this. These little animals have evolved in one of the most challenging environments on Earth, the marine environment. Demands of fishing and communication have made them very, very intelligent animals. But simply, they come to the boat for fun, to bow ride. I find it amazing uh, that a wild animal will come in and associate with humans of its own free will. Do you think that in the early days of man taking to the sea that these dolphins were coming in to explore this, this potential threat and that they were escorting these boats away from vulnerable members of the group? Well, I'm sure in the early days of maritime history that that would have been the case, but we now believe that the, the dolphins are simply coming into the boat to play and to bow ride with it. Um, just like your dog with a stick in the garden, they're simply playing. Uh, after all, you and I spend our time out there floating around on boats. We're just another part of this ever-changing and challenging environment for these guys to seek us out and have a look. Seeing these stunning little dolphins unconstrained and free to roam over huge distances is a privilege many of us don't get to see. This is in stark contrast to watching dolphins in captive facilities, performing demeaning tricks for morsels of food. In Ireland, all marine mammals are protected. And although West Cork is very well known for its varied and amazing marine wildlife, there are none more engaging than the short-beaked common dolphin. Its habit of associating with humans entirely of its own free will ensures a place in our hearts and alongside our boats as we venture in and out of the harbours of West Cork. Nestled amidst the coastal hills near the picturesque village of Union Hall, an extraordinary sight awaits. Amongst the rugged beauty where land meets sea, a curious array of unusual animals invites tourists, visitors and curious locals alike to embark on an enchanting journey where their fluffy companions await to accompany them. I think that alpacas have a very, um, very unique um, expression or personality uh, character. Um, they belong to the camel family uh, that has a, a kind of a unique expression as well, you know, um, what, what we know as camels, the bigger ones. Um, yeah, so they are very sociable animals, uh, very gentle animals, very calm animals. Um, but also very curious. Benjamin Von Ammon and his wife Anastasia are the passionate couple behind Alpaca Walk West Cork, a cherished family business that weaves together their love for these gentle creatures and Benjamin's encyclopedic knowledge of all things alpaca. When we came here in, in 2019, when we decided to fully move here, we brought the two horses with us. Um, that's when we rented the fields there and um, at the beginning I was just looking for some additional grazing animals that wouldn't be that hard on the, on the ground as horses are. 
So I found out that alpacas have these very soft feet and are very gentle on the ground. Yeah, and then everything came together. You know, I looked into the alpacas. Um, I got four of them just to get started and, and get some experience. And as soon as I got them, I, I knew that I would like to do something with training alpacas, working with, with people and, and alpacas. Definitely, I would say the scenery is, is, is special here, of course. As soon as you get around the house, you have the full view from, from Galley Head almost over to Toe Head. And the walks are all sandy coastal walks alongside the coast, up the coast, down the coast. And so, so I think that's what makes these alpaca walks definitely special. Before we started to get people coming here, I wanted to get familiar with the animal and, and train them. So we did the whole program, you know, starting with getting them used to my presence, um, getting the halter on the head collar, getting them on the lead, starting to walk them on the road, through the fields, um, just to, to make them familiar with everything. Often people are, are worried that, that the alpacas would spit. <laughs> Um, alpacas do spit, but um, it's something they do towards each other and not towards humans. You need to put a lot of pressure on an alpaca to make it spit at you. So once they are properly trained, uh, there's no reason to be afraid of that. set up the wool workshop, we included that into the box now, uh, where my wife gives spinning demonstrations and people can even try to spin their own alpaca yarn, you know. So I think that adds really nicely to the whole concept and, and makes it more um, complete. And, um, and the next uh, step for us really just happened with the birth of our uh, first alpaca baby here. Uh, in the fields and um, yeah that was really exciting and, and very very special and that's our start into the alpaca breeding um, where we obviously also want to focus on the fiber quality of the alpaca wool and um, breed our own um, alpacas for the fiber. Um, I think that's something really special that you you're not only able to walk an alpaca but you'll also be able to buy a hat or a scarf or some kind of clothing of that alpaca, you know. When we walk them, we move through the fields like they move through their environment and we just tune into their kind of perspective of life and, um, and I think they have a very chilled perspective on life, yeah. Sightings of humpbacks off the Irish south coast are relatively few and far between, but as the season for their arrival approaches, whale enthusiasts, photographers and researchers ready themselves for encounters that may span only a few hours. Rarely do humpbacks remain in one area for any great length of time. Encounters with humpback whales along the south coast of Ireland are with animals coming into feed on a variety of shoaling fish. Individual animals are recognized by the unique pattern of black and white markings on the underside of the tail. No two animals are the same. By photographing this pattern and comparing it with images taken during previous encounters, enthusiasts have established that many of the animals we see off the south coast of Ireland are regular visitors coming back year after year. Most commonly sighted feeding during the late autumn months, these animals are thought to be part of a northeastern Atlantic population of humpbacks that are moving south for the winter, stopping off along the south coast of Ireland to feed opportunistically. Occasional sightings off the south coast in January may suggest that some individuals, probably non-breeding stock, remain feeding into the spring months. 
My colleague Aidan Coffey, an experienced marine mammal photographer, has been taking pictures of great whales off West Cork for many years. His images of humpbacks have contributed significantly to our knowledge of the activity of these animals off the West Cork coast. I originally started going down to Baltimore uh, in West Cork in the early 1980s and at that stage nobody really mentioned whales at all. They just they, they were just something that weren't there. And I continued to go there and uh, after, uh, as sort of uh, as the years progressed whale watching became a, a bigger and bigger part of, of Baltimore and various whale watching boats started operating. I started going out with them and started seeing the whales. And from there, I developed an interest in photographing uh, all sorts of wildlife. And the whale operator boats were very good in that they'd call me and tell me when there was interesting wildlife around. I think the main thing about humpbacks that makes them photogenic is their activity levels. They're somewhat like a, a large dolphin. They tend to like jumping around the place. They wave their tails out of the air. They, uh, they hoover along the surface, lunge feeding with their mouths wide open. Uh, they're quite happy to jump right out of the water on occasions um, and they engage in this activity uh, called uh, bubble netting or bubble feeding where they lay a circle of bubbles uh, to trap the, to enclose the fish and then they surface in the middle with their mouths wide open and that's particularly fantastic from a ph photographic point of view because it, you know exactly where where the whale is going to surface and when uh, you know when you see the bubbles there you've got about 10 seconds and you know the the whale will appear in the, in the middle of those bubbles. Now, if you're looking for humpbacks or for any whales, the first thing to, to look for is a lot of bird activity. And if you're out on a calm day and you see lots of birds flying around in a particular area, that probably suggests fish. And if there's fish there, you'll start to get dolphins and, and whales if, if they're around. Um, the next challenge is to keeping your camera steady. Um, and the you know, if you're out in a, a very light boat like a rib and there's even a s slight swell running, you, you, the rib will be moving up and down uh, quite a lot. It's better to be in a big heavy boat once you've found the whales. On the other hand, that's a slower boat and it might be harder to find them in the first place because you can't move around so quickly to, to find them. So you, uh, you've, you've swings and roundabouts there. Um, you've got to get close enough to them to get a decent shot. Um, you know, you probably want to be within about 100 meters or so of them. And uh, it, it's not really practical to use a very long lens, you know, handheld on a boat. Uh, it, it can be tricky to hold it steady. Um, if you can get within 100 meters, that's, that's pretty good. One of the most charismatic of all the great whales, it is no wonder first sightings of humpback whales off West Cork causes such great excitement among photography and whale enthusiasts alike. Their very unpredictability and habit of appearing suddenly and unexpectedly adds to the sense of wonder and awe generated by these fabulously beautiful marine mammals. Situated about five kilometres from the market town of Skibbereen in West Cork, Loch Eyne is Ireland's first designated marine reserve and a habitat for plants and animals not found anywhere else in the country. The loch is home to a permanent marine research station and is one of the most studied sites of its size and kind anywhere in the world. But for many, it provides a wealth of recreational opportunities throughout the year, both waterborne and around its periphery. This is a special place for us and we love swimming, you know, and uh, we love, exactly. basically we love the place. It's so hard to say, but you know, it's great to have a goggles and diving because it's, just, it's a fantastic place. We just love it. We love to be here. Well, we love to come and swim here. The water is absolutely amazing. A social swimming group, the Loch Hine Lappers, meets here regularly and group swims are arranged on most days, regardless of the weather conditions or the time of year. There's something literally magical about it. I know that's a cliche, but it's very true. I think the natural beauty of the place is the, the most important thing. Um, there's just 
the water's warmer out than outside in the, the, the sea and uh, it's just a beautiful place to swim. The group attracts swimmers of all abilities, from dippers, who come for a gentle paddle in the shallows, to the more serious, some of whom use the lake as a training ground for long distance open water swimming challenges. I caught up with Dr. Rob McCallan from UCC, who has spent many years studying the loch's unique flora and fauna. So there's been archaeological records showing the first human interaction around Loch Ine uh, was over six and a half thousand years ago, and uh, up to about 4,000 years ago it was an entirely freshwater lake, uh, but with the end of the glacial period and sea levels rising it became a marine uh, lake around that time and we have geological records showing the transition from a freshwater plankton to a marine plankton during this time period. So the main defining feature of Loch Ine is its current flow regime. So you have water entering through the rapids at three to four meters a second on maximum flow and then as it moves around the lake, it becomes slower and slower. So in each of these different flow regimes, we see very different specific animal communities. We have a number of quite rare species that you wouldn't find anywhere else in uh, Ireland. And more and more, because the seawater in Loch Ine tends to be a couple of degrees warmer, we have a number of invasive species that are now set to become established here in the loch. So a lot of our current research will be related to some of those effects. The Heritage Centre in Skibbereen is a mine of information for those wishing to find out more about the loch and its surroundings. But to experience its magical qualities firsthand, we embarked on a gentle twilight paddle with Jim Kennedy. Jim considers Loch Hine to be one of the prime locations in Ireland for paddlers of all abilities. The lake itself is quite small Nick, for kayaking. The kayaks are across it very quickly. But for us, it gives us great access to the ocean in a very safe environment. You know, we can go down the, the rapid, as you call it, if you get the conditions right, and then we're out to sea. And it's lovely and sheltered here. The waters tend to be warmer here too. So, you know, if we have beginners, this is a very safe area to teach them. And then we progress down the rapids out to sea. So for us, it's a fantastic uh, playground and safe classroom as well, a safe environment. The lake is one thing, but the energy around here is phenomenal like with the hill and the valley and the forests and the animals. The whole thing, I think the, the Druids or the Pagans, or whoever were around, or the Catholics in the olden days, they had a sauce, they knew this was a special place. I once came across a group of Americans who were writing a book about the ley lines of the world, and they told me that three of them crossed in this area, and that, the, that was their explanation of the energy. But me, I'm a romantic, so I just like to close my eyes and get lost in the energy of the place. Sharks first appeared in the fossil record just over 400 million years ago. One of three filter feeding members of the shark family that include the whale shark and the megamouth shark, the basking shark is the second largest fish on earth. Basking sharks reach lengths of between 6 and 8 metres when adult, although larger individuals have been recorded at 12 metres. These amazing and beautiful fish appear as early as April around some parts of the Irish south and west coasts. We have encountered them off West Cork as late as September. Regrettably, bycatch, direct harvesting for their fins and ship strike remain the greatest threat for this species. They are of course protected around the Irish coast and there are many places that are becoming a mecca for those wishing to look at and study this huge fish. 
I wanted to learn more about these remarkable animals. And I went out with Vincent Highland, who has been studying these animals and filming them off the Irish coast for over 20 years. So my first encounter with a basking shark was when I was 12. I was down in Kerry, in Derry Nan, actually. And it used to um, put on a mask and uh, snorkel and some fins and I used to jump in the water with a bag of stones so that I could try and get down on a single breath as deep as I could and when I came up um, there was a basking shark beside me I didn't actually know what it was um, I got scared really scared <laughs> and uh, I swam like mad to get into the shore and sat in the rock and I just saw this thing going back and forth and back and forth didn't know what it was and then I mentioned it to a couple of fellas in the village and they told me that it was uh, a sunfish um, and that it fed on plankton, the smallest little piece. So I mean, you know, 12 year old, this was an amazing encounter. And um, many years later then, I never got, I never got really the opportunity uh, to see one because we were always in Dublin. And eventually then, um, I was lucky enough uh, to get my first uh, rigid inflatable boat and I invested in some film gear. And I went from there then, and for the last 25 years, um, nearly every year or two years at least, anyway, I've gotten in the water with basking sharks. I'm just absolutely fascinated by them. Yeah. It's brilliant. There's three different light intensities on it. So, I'll so the south and west and northwest coast of Ireland are fantastic for basking sharks to accumulate during the summer. And that's probably because, you know, the waters are clear. You also get these incredibly large plankton blooms. So it's a fantastic place to feed. They're not going to go hungry here. Uh, there's no disturbance really, I think that's key as well. So um, they go in and out of pl plankton blooms, they go, they move one way and then they turn around and come back into the plankton bloom. And there's also things like maybe this is uh, from a behavioural perspective and particularly in terms of, you know, reproduction, this um, nose to tail, nose to tail behaviour, perhaps maybe is something to do with courtship. So they could come into these, these waters because of that too. Um, nobody really knows. Uh, but also then in terms of, you know, protecting um, the, the young basking sharks, you know, uh, do the young basking sharks, for instance, learn off the, you know, the mother or the parents and um, do they congregate in groups sometimes like that in terms of social and maybe is it a case that uh, you know the young uh, learns how to feed and go through these particular plankton blooms so there's all of those things going on in relation to uh, basking shark behavior and the reason why they come to this particular part of Ireland the south the west and the northwest One has just gone down behind you there, Vinny. I think he's going to come back up as he comes into the turn there. Okay. So another thing about basking sharks is, you know, why do they feed on the surface? Well, it's probably because when you get plankton blooms, for instance, everything, particularly zooplankton, is swimming up towards the surface and the plant plankton that they eat um, also tends to uh, accumulate in sunlight. So it's going to maximize the uh, uh, available light um, and in doing so then, it attracts all of that microscopic plankton up to the surface. There's also these vertical water column, these currents that actually upwell and they bring uh, the plankton up to the surface. So for instance then, the, the basking shark primarily concentrates its efforts on the surface. And that's why when you're looking for basking sharks, the big telltale sign from a distance is the triangular fin. Sometimes you'll actually see two in the water, uh, but it's generally, you've got the large triangular dorsal fin, but then you've got the tail fin as well, just sticking itself out. And usually that's very floppy, you know. So they feed on the surface because that's where the food comes up to. It upwells and it's maximizing them um, on the sunlight. So productive, really, it's, it's, it's a productive sunlit environment. Sometimes actually when, you, when they see you, um, they'll close their mouths, you know, and they'll stop feeding, and then they turn into what I call a proper shark. Because when you see a basking shark for the first time, or perhaps most times, they don't really look like shark. They're just like this. This uh, they look like this giant mouth uh, in the water that has a tapering body. And um, I suppose, you know, in the context of studying them, it's really just for me. It's been in terms of their behaviour. I remember, for instance, uh, filming uh, a group of about maybe seven off Valencia. Uh, one year and uh, seeing for the first time that there was lampreys um, stuck to their undersides 
and there was another connection you know you had the sea, sea lamprey that would come in into shore to you know to spawn up the rivers and then it would go back out and then it would attach itself onto a basking shark so you know I was fascinated about the the whole kind of interrelationships with basking sharks the basking shark has been trawling the world's ocean in its current form for nearly 25 million years. It is listed on the IUCN Red List as vulnerable and may become endangered if we do not globally address the issues that are threatening its survival and reproduction. For our grandchildren not to be able to drift on a sunlit calm ocean watching these magnificent giants weaving back and forth in search of their tiny planktonic prey would be nothing short of a tragedy. The best experience I can have with any wild animal is to get into their environment and just take a look. Look at, look at the size of it, look at the colour, the mottled green colour, the greeny kind of cream, stunning, and the shape of the fins and then the big tail and as underwater, like when it just goes, glides past you, you can just see that tail and it's going like that, real slow, but purposely, you know, and it, it, it's doing that for a reason. I'm just blown away by that, you know, it's amazing, fantastic. Happy birthday, but ask a chance, you know. <laughs> Lying on the banks of the River Island, the market town of Skibbereen is characterised by its many colourful traditional buildings and shop fronts, and is now at the forefront of digital technology. The town, however, has a dark past. It was devastated by the Great Famine of the 1840s and 50s, and lies close to the infamous famine burial pits at Abastruri which hold the remains of up to 10,000 unidentified victims. A permanent famine exhibition is on display at the Heritage Centre, where visitors can learn about the human tragedy that befell the local population during this period. More recently, Skibbereen has been in the news for more joyous reasons. Formed in 1970, Skibbereen Rowing Club has produced many of Ireland's top rowers, including the O'Donovan brothers who claimed a lightweight double skull silver medal in Rio, Ireland's first Olympic medal in the sport of rowing. The club's success continued in 2017 as they pocketed three gold medals at the World Rowing Championships. River rowing, however, is not the only form of the sport which is practised in West Cork. I've come to the village of Glandor, about 12 kilometres east of the town of Skibbereen, to find out about coastal rowing, a sport that is increasing in popularity both here in the West Cork region and elsewhere in Ireland. The Maccabee Rowing Club is one of a number of local coastal rowing clubs based in West Cork. It previously existed as Glandor Harbour Rowing Club. There is a rich history of rowing in Glandor Harbour, and reports in the Southern Star talk of rowing races taking place there as far back as the late 1800s. We wanted to know where did the sport originate and how was it governed? Rowing in, in West Cork started off really as, as was part of um, the livelihood of fishermen. Um, they ha would have had rowing boats and it, uh, it, it basically were, they were over time they were used in for, for racing. Uh, the sport I guess, I guess kind of moved on then about 40 years ago there was uh, a movement by a number of people to try and formalise uh, so an association uh, to try and I guess set down some, some rules for regattas and the, the first meeting of the South West Coast Jarl Rowing Association happened in 1978. Over the winter period the club holds social rows every Sunday. This provides an opportunity for those who are interested in learning the sport to come along and have a go. The club caters for all ages 
from youngsters of 10 years old to youngsters of more senior age. <laughs> I've just been invited down to go out with the Kilbacker Bee Rowing Club. I don't know what, what it's going to be like, but I've rowed a punt before, but never one of these boats, so it's going to be a hell of an experience. I have never had so much fun in all my life. It was absolutely fantastic. And the guys and gals were so welcoming. It's been a fantastic experience. Coastal rowing may not be as well known as its river rowing cousin, but it holds a special place in the hearts of the people of West Cork. And for some, it's more than just a sport. It isn't all about winning. It is about the people you meet along the way. There's youngsters, there's children, there's everyone out there performing at their best. They might be winning, but they're giving everything they have. The estuary of Los Carvery is a magnet for many estuarine bird species. One of which was an infrequent visitor, but is now an established resident. The little egret is now considered an established Irish bird. This handsome member of the heron family is now regularly sighted on rivers, inlets and estuaries around the Irish coast. It is easy to forget that the first breeding record for this species in Ireland was as recent as 1997 at a site in County Cork. Data gathered during the last 20 years have yielded some interesting patterns and trends in our populations of native Irish and itinerant bird species. Not all have been positive, but there are none more remarkable than that of the little egret. Detailed ringing studies in Ireland have yielded some important data about breeding ecology and dispersal of young birds. Although the majority of resightings are here in Ireland, in 2010, a young bird was located in the Azores, a journey of over 2,000 kilometers. And as recently as 2013, a young bird fledged from the Galway colony was located as far north as Iceland. Go out there, Mr. Ferry. Paul Connaughton has been a birding enthusiast since he was a small boy and has followed the little egret story in West Cork since those early sightings, travelling many miles in the 1980s to get a glimpse of this bird when it was still regarded as rare in Ireland. My first little egret was way back in 1989 actually. Um, Kind of a funny story. I remember myself and a friend of mine hearing about this uh, little egret that had turned up in a place called Tecumption in Wexford. So we borrowed some bicycles from some friends of ours and we cycled. It was about 50 kilometres of a cycle, there, there and back like 100 kilometres. But uh, we got there and we seen this amazing white 
heron with, with, with these black legs and these bright yellow feet. It's just something we'd never, you know, it was up there with one of the really target birds we wanted to see growing up. You know, they were quite common through Europe and, you know, looking in books, it's just one of those birds that really was high on the radar for things you wanted to see. But to see them in Ireland was incredible, you know. The literature would suggest that the little egret was fairly common in Northern Europe in the Middle Ages. It is thought that hunting for its meat and plumage were the main causes for its decline. Most of us think of the little egret as a temperate or even tropical bird, so their recent northward expansion into colder regions is all the more fascinating. Well, we're here now in Ross Carberry in West Cork, and this is probably one of the first places actually in, in Ireland where it had uh, a couple of resident little egrets. You know, I, I remember traveling down here to see them. Um, and it, they love this kind of uh, coastal habitat, you know, especially if there's uh, kind of a freshwater salt marsh type uh, scenario as well. It's, it's their preferred habitats. Um, and that's, it's, it, it's habitats like this where, where nearby where they first bred for the first time in Ireland. Um, that was in 1997. There was a, a small colony was found in uh, East Cork, uh, almost on a Cork-Waterford border. Um, and the following year, there was three other colonies found. And this all happened very, very fast. And between, between 97 and 2001, um, they really did start to establish uh, a, a thriving population in Ireland. The current expansion of the little egret is thought by some to be a microcosm of a wider evolutionary process and we may see further expansion of this species as the iris population grows. One thing is certain, the little egret story in Ireland is not over yet. Our winters have been very mild for quite a while now, but there's, there's nothing to say that in, in the future we might get a, a, a ten year period where the winters get very cold. It does happen, and if that happens, that might put an end to uh, Ireland's wintering little egrets. You know, if things get too cold, they're going to start migrating south again. So as long as it's nice and mild here, you know, wet and mild, it's not for everyone, but it suits, it suits birds very well. We get, a, we get huge populations of birds from all over northern Europe that come and spend the winter here because it's so mild. And, and the wet doesn't really bother them. Many Ross Carberry residents take the presence of the little egret for granted. This was not always the case. I went to Kenya working uh, in the late, in 80s and I returned in the middle 90s and when I left there wasn't a single egret in the lagoon in Ross Carberry where I lived up there in the convent and when I came back it was it wasn't full of egrets there were a lot of egrets and I note they nested over there where the herons nest in the same bush so it was lovely to see them greeting me when I came home Celebrations of the return of light are common throughout history, with feasting, festivals and holidays around the time of the winter solstice to celebrate the sun god's rebirth. In pre-Christian times, our pagan ancestors would hold a 12-day festival at winter solstice, celebrating the rebirth of the sun god, with fires being lit to celebrate the heat and life-giving properties of the returning sun. I'm facilitating here today is like kind of a capsule of gathering people um, and you know there's people coming here anyway today to not just be with me and my capsule but they'll just join in anyway and I share I suppose spaces for people to come together to drop into their own I suppose energy and their own intuition and their own connection to their ancestors or their healing and it, yeah it's quite a big it kind of continues into a bigger space. I thought I'd just come and see what was happening um, and as you can see there's a few people gathering around and I think there's going to be some dramas going on and maybe some dance workshops I'm a little bit apprehensive of that but you know give it a whirl. There's people from 
like all over coming and they're finding this energy here really potent and really healing and they are tapping into it so it's kind of like the energy resources underneath us like if you talk about crystal grids and it gets like way out there like why is this happening and there's obviously something here in this tiny little speck that we are it's a place of light and the fact that the sun um, does enter the circle here i think this is a place of light More people are definitely waking up nowadays, I think, to the to the energy and to the wanting to reconnect. And I think yoga has actually brought a big, huge connection in and they're starting to find more Celtic aspects rather than the Indian. And when we start sounding often, you start hearing things that you've never heard before, or you start experiencing things that you've never experienced before. And that's kind of the power, I suppose, of people gathering together, sharing their voices or sharing their energy and sharing their wants and their futures. And, like really people want to be um, in a community and people want to be together and they want to feel from the heart I suppose and the soul and that's a kind of a redirection because we get lost in the world that we live in today. It's very open, it's too just gone a bit crazy and coming back really just brings us back to the nature and back into this kind of like, what? why are we here? Few would deny that West Cork is a special place of tranquility and peace in this hectic world. Its wildlife, its people, all go to make it a jewel in the crown that is Wild Ireland. A very special destination for the many people who come to experience its quiet laneways and its rugged, unforgiving Atlantic coast. But for many, what is so special about West Cork is the amazing people and their incredible hospitality. But we will leave you with some views of the fabulous scenery that forms the spectacular backdrop to everything that is wild West Cork.